Good to see you this morning. I'm really glad that you're here. When you walk through the door, uh, in addition to all the other cards that you got bombarded with, and we're glad that you did, uh, you also had an opportunity to pick up sermon notes. If you did not pick those up when you walked through the door, if you'll raise your hand, one of our ushers or usherettes will get those to you right away. I like that usherette. I'm not sure that's a good word up front. Forgive me for that. Uh, anyway, they're going to be bringing them to you right now. And uh, I've done something that I haven't done in a while, and that is that I've uh, used the old fill-in-the-blank teacher plan. So uh, today we're going to talk about a lot of stuff, and I'm going to move kind of quickly, but I want you to just take uh, fill-in-the-blank. There's also a place that you can take your, uh, put your own notes in the back. And uh, the reason we do that is that there's a hope that you'll take this message. I, I understand. I, listen, I understand that uh, all of us, our memories are only as long as our longest pencil. So uh, the fact of it is, if you don't, uh, if you don't engage with note taking or you don't engage with thinking about and discussing the things that we talk about this morning, then chances are you may vaguely remember it next week when we come back. But the truth is, most of us forget it, including me. Sometimes I have to go back. Well, what did I preach on last week? And then I have to. But I actually spent all week long thinking about praying over and working this thing to make sure that that I'm living what God is speaking to me to talk to you about. And so, uh, you know, I, I want to be his vessel. I want God to use me to inspire you, to teach you, to train you, to equip you, and to help you. And this week we are continuing our series on how the life that God rewards and how we live in such a way as that we might be able to uh, begin laying up treasure in heaven. That's what God said. Jesus said that. It's not like, you know, an idea that I'm trying to come up with or, or that we're trying to inspire you to name it, claim it, and get something, you know. The, the reality is Jesus, when he talked about heaven, when he talked about our life, when the Apostle Paul talked about how we live, he often reference the fact that God was laying up or writing down, had a book of remembrance that he's writing those things down that we do in his name, that we do for his people, that we do for others. And, and so it's really important that we understand that. We've said it over and over again. It's kind of the big idea for this entire series, and that is that we go... Help me with it. Give, give it to me on the board here, and let's all say it together. We all go to heaven. Why? Not that one, the other one. We go to heaven. Sorry, I, I, I got you out of, out, of, out of sync there. So we go... I'm sorry? Okay, very well. All right, so you'll just have to pull it up from memory. You go to heaven based on what? Jesus did for you. But the reward in heaven is based on what you do with what God has given you, with the life that he's given you, the opportunities that he's given you here. Now, I'm not using that as a bait and switch to get you to do something. I'm just telling you that's the economy of God. And so if we can comprehend that, if we can lay hold of that, we can move forward in the things of God and realize every day we're partnering with him to do great things. Awesome. So it's back there now. So now let's go over to Hebrews chapter 6 now that we've kind of got broke. We shuffled the deck and got it all mixed up. And I'm sorry, Eric, that was my fault, not yours. But I want to talk to you now uh, from Hebrews chapter 6. Last week we studied Hebrews uh, chapter 11 a little bit, and we're going to go back to that in just a moment. But I want you to see this passage as well. And it's important that you recognize that God is working in us and working through us. So Hebrews 6.10, for God is not not unjust, to what? Forget your work. God is not unjust to forget your work and the labor of love which you have shown towards his name in that you have ministered to the saints and that you do minister. Remember the word minister means to serve. It means to carry the burden or Lift the burden for others. And so the writer of Hebrews wants you to understand God is not unjust. He sees what you're doing and he takes note of it. We often think, I believe, that he takes note of the bad stuff we do, of our failures, of our limitations, that he's keeping a record of all my wrongs so that one day he can get me and get me real good. That's kind of the way the world thinks about God. 
But the reality of it is, is that he's already, he's already paid the ultimate price to satisfy the anger of God, the wrath of God that was pent up against you. And when you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that is satisfied. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't live godly lives. No, what it means is that, that God's not waiting to get you. He's already gotten you. He's gotten you in the person of Jesus Christ. And what he wants to do now is empower you to be Christ in the earth. Not that you're going to be Jesus with the, the, with the stigmata or something, but that you, Christ in you, wherever you go, can utilize you. In fact, I like to say it this way, God makes you a Holy Ghost taxi cab. He just wants to go into food line with you. He wants you to be cognizant of the fact there's someone there that you're going to encounter that really your smile is going to be enough to inspire them. Your reaction when they, when they pick up the cantaloupe that you were just waiting to pick up. And, and you, you reach for it and they pick up that very special cantaloupe that has Vince's name on it. And they reach for it and they get that can That you don't blow it, you know. That you reached over and in the line at Bojangles and you paid for someone's meal. Why? Because you wanted to extend the favor and the blessing of God that you've received. All these different ways that we've talked about in the past, we're God just wants to use you, and he wants to demonstrate his amazing grace in you and through you. And he says, listen, I do not forget that. Last week, we just took that myth that, that we have to do something heroic. It was Memorial Day, and we talked about Specialist Jinx and how she, in training, in her paratrooper training, lost her life. It wasn't in war. It wasn't a heroic act. We don't know her particularly, but her, com com her commander said she was a good soldier. She practiced. She did everything she was supposed to do. And in that process, she paid the ultimate price. And so he remembered her, and we remembered her, not because she was a hero or because of some amazing thing that she did. Her amazing thing was that she did the things she was called to do daily without fail. And as we talked about in her life and in the lives of other soldiers, it is the practice. In fact, just today I was, when I was coming to, to uh, the, the building here, I was listening to a podcast, and this individual, I had no clue what he was going to talk about, but he talked about how uh, we all have this idea that put in the, in the worst of situations, we will all become heroic. We'll all become like Jack Bauer. I don't know if you remember. We'll all become Clark Kent, you know, and be able to pull the Superman thing off. But he said, in reality, you're only as good as your training. And in, in crisis moments, you will always revert to the lowest level of your training. And I wanted to argue that point with him. No, 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 no. If I see something happen, I'm going to immediately become Superman. I'm immediate, listen, if I'm faced with someone who's sick and, and hurting, I'm immediately going to become man of faith. If I'm faced with someone who's, you know, bound by darkness, in, in, encapsulated in some kind of uh, a bondage, I'm immediately going to become a warrior that's able to cast out devils in the name of Jesus. Come on, church, you're just sleeping on me now. You're going to have to wake up. That goes for you guys online as well. You know good and well in your mind, when you look in the mirror of your mind and you're reading and you're all prayed up, you just know, given the opportunity, you're going to raise the dead. But as I said last week, if you can't get out of bed, you're probably not going to raise the dead. And every one of us need to recognize that what we're talking about here and what we're practicing for, what we're doing in advancing God's kingdom is we are practicing for those moments when God calls on you, when he puts something before you, someone before you that needs a divine touch. It really isn't about you. It's not about how wonderful your waffles were this morning or how holy your Bible reading was this morning. It's about a consistent life lived in the presence of God that when you walk into the darkness, the light is present and you're not in your strength but in His strength. Come on. And that's what brings change and transformation. And God says whenever you do that, whenever you live that way, whenever you get that comprehension, you can be inspired because God has no, he has no greater joy than to see you walking in truth. And he delights in giving you opportunities. Not opportunities so you can flex your spiritual muscles and everybody can see your man a t-shirt and think, oh, you're really something. No, so that they can see even in your weakest moments. 
Even in your weakness, his strength is made strong and perfect. And so when you're faced with opportunities or uh, uh, obstacles, we need to recognize it's just another moment that God's giving us a chance to build into eternity. It's not about the heroics. It's about being obedient in the daily things, the daily things of prayer, the daily things of seeking after him. In fact, we talked about that at some length last week. And so let me move on, and I want to I want to give you seven different things in the scripture. And I know you're thinking seven. Most sermons only have three points in a poem, and you're giving us seven points. Well, I want you to get your money's worth. <laughs> I'm joking about that, obviously, but no, I'm going to give you seven things. We talked about one of them. The first one we talked about last week in detail, so I'm just going to touch on it. But there's seven, and you can write these down, and then I want you to explore them and pray over them and say, God, show me how you can use me in these ways. So number one, we talked about this last week. Now, I want you to fill in the blanks. So number one, the first way I want you to realize that God uses you and that God rewards you, that the thing that you do, the first thing is seeking. The word is seeking, S-E-E-K. I, it's up on the board. You don't need me to spell it. Seeking the Lord. And we talked about this last week through prayer, through his word, through fasting, through praise and worship. Man, we sang that song this morning, the last one we sang about coming to the altar. And I just had this urge, and, and I probably just quenched the Holy Spirit. I just wanted to run up here and say, guys, listen to this song. Some of you are sitting right now, and you've got the weight of the world on you, and he's saying, bring it to the altar. It's not just a song. Now, it is a song, but that's what the altar is for, to lay it upon the altar. Jesus died, took the weight of your sin to the altar. And I'm not just talking about you know, up here where you come to the mourner's bench. I'm talking about the, the altar of the presence of God where you say, God, I can't change this. I've been praying about this and praying, and I can't change this. You, you can't change your spouse. You can't change your child. Oh, you can beat them. You can manipulate them. But you can't change their heart. And the reality is life change doesn't come except through heart change. And most of us don't change until it hurts too bad to stay the same. Are you with me? And so this idea of coming to the altar, this idea of worshiping in the house together, this is a moment where we can encourage. Sometimes I don't feel like lifting my hands. I get that. But this is a place where we can come together together and worship him but we can also do that at our homes we can also do that alone we can do it in the car and wherever we do this god said in his word just last week we read it in jeremiah 29 verses 12 13 and 14 he says whenever you seek me i will be found of you if you will come after me i'll come after you and so the first thing I want you to see this morning and write in your notes is that when you come after God, when you seek after God with all your heart, when you seek after Him, God, your will, not my will, your way, not my way. God, I'm going to surrender to you. I want you to be first in my life. I want you to be first in my relationships, in my marriage, in my family. I want you to be first on my job. I want to honor you. When you do that, God sees your heart. He sees your determination. He sees your action. And he begins working in you so that he can work through you. And there he begins to produce in you some incredible things. Incredible things. Remember, we read this from Hebrews chapter 11, and I want to read it again, verse 6. It says this, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. We all know it. We, many of us quote, and I see your lips moving right now. It's impossible to please him. For if we, we come to God, we must believe that he, what? That he is God. Now, some of us need an adjustment to our theology. He's not just another God. He is the Lord God, creator of everything. He is the God supreme. And as the God supreme, it's not God here and you here, big God, little God. No, it's only one God. He's only one God. And he says if you come to him, you must understand. You must you may not be able to comprehend it all, but you must believe he is God. And as God, understand that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. He rewards you with his presence. 
He rewards you with his goodness. I was reading in the Psalms this morning, and man, I just couldn't tear myself away from the Psalms over and over. It was talking about how I'm going to come. One, one place he says, come and see the testimony. Come and hear the story. Come and see what God has done in my life. Oh, boys and girls, I want to tell you something. We often focus on the problem. We often focus on the, pr- the pitfalls. But God says every one of those places, every one of those pitfalls, every one of those challenges, he wants to use to magnify his name in you and through you. Can you say amen? amen? But the only way you could do that is let him be God. So know that he is God and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Several weeks ago, uh, Pastor Vince was teaching on this subject and he talked about the two Greek words that we uh, get that are used here in this idea of God being a rewarder and God repaying us for the things that we do. How we how we Put up treasure in heaven. Those two words, and I'll just give them to you in the Greek, and not because it makes you smarter to be able to know them, but sometimes it's just fun to be able to say words. And the first word is mythos, mythos, and that means the payment of wages. When you, uh, at the end of the week, when, when you receive your check, now it's usually deposited in your account, or you receive your, your paycheck, that is the idea of being paid for paid wages for the work that you have done. You agreed to do a job, and you did that job, and they gave you your wages. The second word, and I really like this one. It just sounds good. It is a a pit of It sounds really good when you can say it, but you can't say it fast. Help me out, Vance. A pit of And that's not right, but I can't say it because I didn't mess myself up. Uh, Apodidami means to reward. But now listen, this is what really is cool about these two words together. God repays and God rewards. rewards. But here in this verse, Hebrews eleven six, 6, it's the only place in the Bible where these two words, which are used often in the New Testament, it's the only place in the Bible where the two words are joined together in a compound word, meaning that he is a repayer and a rewarder. It, the, the two are not synonymous, but he... The writer of Hebrews connects them together. But another thing that's very important here is that it's not just the only place these two words are used together, but it's also the only place when they're not used as a verb to repay or to reward, but rather they're used to describe someone, to describe God as the repayer and the rewarder. He is the only one that can repay you for what you've done. He is the only one that will reward you for what you've done. Now listen to me. I'm going to tell you something that's going to probably shock you in the end when all has been said and done and the age is over and men are judged by God for what they've done and they are separated those that have followed him and those that have rejected him the Bible says those that have rejected Christ will spend eternity separated from God and they will spend that eternity in the place that was created for Lucifer and his angels we call that place help me out hell So often we get the image, because Walt Disney gave us this image, that the devil's down there punishing us, and we're down there somehow, and the devil's partying and beating on our heads and stoking the fire, and we think because we're in hell, we are now under the domain of the devil. But you need to hear this. The God who rewards with eternal life is the same God who punishes with eternal death. Y'all ain't hearing me. The same God who rewards with eternal life is the same God who will judge because of rejecting the name of Jesus Christ and salvation. And so to spend eternity separated from light, separated from love, separated from compassion, separated from mercy is a choice that we make, but it's a choice that once made into eternity, we come under the eternal wrath of God forever. You're not under the devil's wrath. You're under God's wrath. But God says, listen, you don't have to be there. In fact, the Bible says, I put my wrath on Jesus so that you might not taste of that wrath. It's not even appointed to you. But because you reject the sacrifice, i got to go on. Or I'll never get past point one. And that was going to be a real short one. I hope that's helping you, though. 
Jesus says you're free. You are free. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I have come and I have taken upon myself all of your sin and the judgment of God. I have satisfied the wrath of God so that you might enjoy his goodness forevermore. Mm -mm -mm. He is the rewarder. God chooses, listen, God chooses to reward us I don't comprehend it all. I don't even, even all my years of study, all my years of seminary, I don't understand it all. I can't comprehend it all. But what I do know is this. Listen, God chooses to reward because it is an expression of his own gracious nature. It is an expression of his own gracious nature. God chooses to do this. God chooses. He delights to do this because that's his nature. It is God is love. He wants to bless. He wants to encourage. He wants to bless you. His plan to reward, his provision to save, listen, it is simply an extension and a manifestation of his amazing grace. Number two. I gotta look up and see where we're at in time. Oh, help me, Lord. I hope this is helping you though. I want to listen. Here, here's what my prayer is this morning is that God will inspire you. I don't want to motivate you. I don't want to push you. I want to help the Spirit of God bubble up in you. Someone said we prayed this morning for you, and someone was talking about I need some bubbling, some of the bubbling of the Holy Spirit, the breath of God moving in you. Because that inward inspiration brings transformation. For simply pushing someone with knowledge pushes, pushes them further down. But I want to inspire you. I want you to experience the breath of God. So number two, God rewards you. Listen, now this is, how many of you, have, you got pens? There's pens in the seat back in front of you, if not. Because what I'm about to tell you, I've asked the ushers to lock the back door so you can't get out. That's done. Don't even worry. I'm, what I'm about to tell you is going to blow your mind. Number two, God rewards us for working. Should I spell that for you? It's on the screen. To make your employer successful. You know, when, 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 when your mother asks you to do something and, and she wants you to clean your room, when you do that, God sees that and he rewards you. He rewards you. Listen, this is a matter. Now, this is important. Whether you're an employee or not. In fact, if you, if you read this from the King James or the NIV or almost any of the modern translations, it's, it uses a word that I chose not to use uh, here in Ephesians 6. I, cho I chose uh, the New King James Version. But it says, slaves, obey your masters. And, of course, you know, 100 years ago, and it's still sometimes used in the wrong way, it was used in connotation, in an inappropriate connotation, in the domination of one person over another person. But that's not what God was talking about here. Listen, he is talking of, to bond slaves. New King James Version does a better, I think, a better translation of that. He was talking to bond servants, those who have made a covenant to be in service to. So when you sign a contract, you're a bond servant. When you agree to take a job, you... Your word is your bond. You, therefore, if you said you're going to work for five hours, you work for five hours, whatever that work is. And don't work for four hours and shuffle your feet for one hour and talk about how unjust they are for not paying you enough. And because they don't pay you enough, you're going to take an extra hour free. So you, that's not honoring God, and it's not honoring the person that you work for. God rewards us when we work to make our employer or the company or those that we serve successful. That is a matter, listen, it's a matter of honor and integrity. It's character. Are you listening to me? This is the heartbeat of God within you. The character of God within you. Listen, if you can't say anything nice about the people you work for or the company you work for, you need to do one of two things. First, you need to repent. And two, you may need to find another job. But the reality of it is if you agreed to be there, you are there as God's ambassador and you're called to be a blessing, not called to be a stressing. And no, your boss didn't call me up and pay me to say that. 
But that is reality. It's a matter of integrity, honor. It's a matter of stewardship, stewarding the gift of God in you, the opportunity that God's given you. Are you with me? It's a, it's a, it's a matter of stewardship, but it's also a matter of understanding that you're under authority. Let me read this for you in Ephesians 6, bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters or your bosses according to the flesh, and with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. And if you recognize that what you do, you do first and foremost unto the Lord, he says in Colossians, almost the same thing in Colossians 3, he says, do whatever you do heartily with all your heart as unto the Lord. See, the problem is, I think, I could be wrong, and you can correct me. i got to get back over here in the the light. But I could be wrong. But I think the problem is we see ourselves working for the paycheck or working for the man or working for the company or working for... And and we see that the, the company is rewarding us. We see that our employer is paying us. And it's real easy when we see it that way to begin feeling as if, We're being gypped. We're not being appreciated. We're not being valued because obviously people don't value you as much as you value yourself. But when you change that focus and say, no, when I get to my job, God gave me this job. The Bible says God gave us the power to gain wealth, to gain possession. God gave me this opportunity, and I'm going to walk into this job, and I'm going to be a disciple of Christ. I'm going to do my job as unto the Lord so that when I'm given the opportunity to tell people why I am the way I am, they'll have no recourse to say, well, you're just a lazy bum. How can you say you follow Christ? Does that make any sense to anybody here but me? And if you recognize that and you make that widget, you paint that truck, you do whatever it is you do, you do it and say, Jesus, I want this to be the best one yet. I want this one to reflect. I want this to reflect your glory, your creation, your creative ability, your craftsmanship. You know, I'm not sure we miss something here when i'm making that hamburger and getting ready to serve hamburger and french fries i'm not sure if maybe we miss the possibility that my as a listen as a holy ghost anointed man woman of god serving someone else i'm putting their hamburger together i'm putting their widget together whatever it is i'm doing i'm not sure that when i'm doing that maybe there's a transference of anointing that i can't see cuz i'm looking in the natural but if i am a if i'm cognizant of it and I I'm prayerful about it. When I touch that, then the kingdom of God begins to advance in that. I don't know. I'm not saying a person's going to get evangelized because of hamburger. I mean, maybe you could put a tract inside of it. That wouldn't be too good. But what my point is is that God can use anything as a conductor of his grace to begin drawing them. Does that make any sense at all? Am I nuts? I just don't know. But if I do it as unto the Lord and God blesses that, it could bring transformation. And I'm only on number two. And you knew I would never get to number three, didn't you? Now, I'm going to get there in Jesus' name. I'm going to have to skip a bunch of stuff, but I'm going to get there. And I've had so much fun writing this sermon. I, <sighs> number, number three. So number one, number, number two, number one, seeking God, he rewards us. He, we build rewards by seeking him. Number two, we build rewards by as we serve others, serving as we're serving Christ. Oh, I had so many things I wanted to share with you. Number three, listen, God rewards the work we do when we help others who are in urgent need. When we help the poor, the widows, the orphans, the prisoners. Paul tells Titus, his, his spiritual son Titus, he says to him, Now, Titus, I want you to listen. Listen, I want you to help our people, talking about the Christ followers there. Uh, he, I want you to help our people learn to do good works. I want you to help them recognize opportunity and empower them to do good works. I want you to help them so they will not be unfruitful. 
Now, uh, one of the ways we do that around here, every month we serve meals for the Navigation Center. we got three different small groups that come in and they make sandwiches. They make ham sandwiches and, and turkey sandwiches and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, about 30 or 40 sandwiches plus the stuff to go with it. They make these bags. And then they deliver it to the Navigation Center, which helps folks that are, you know, food challenged or uh, maybe because of COVID or maybe because of unemployment or homelessness, whatever it might be, we provide those and three different small groups one each day provides those meals we 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 help them we provide the the resources they put those meals together then we pray over them and we deliver them now you know you can look at a person and say oh it's just a meal for the homeless i feel good about that but you got to realize we are putting mustard mayonnaise and grace not grease but grace in that bag you don't know when god's gonna Hit that individual, it's going to be an Emmaus Road experience. You don't know when God's going to minister to someone and it changes everything. You don't know when that bologna sandwich is going to become a burning bush. But here's what I do know. As we serve others, God sees it and records it. I'm not doing it to get a reward. I'm doing it. You're doing it because we want to make Jesus' name great. We want to make heaven their home and hell as empty as possible. Mm -mm. James, the half-brother of Jesus in chapter 1, verse 25, he said, listen, he said, you need to understand something. You can read the Bible, but if you aren't a doer of the word, then you're just forgetting it as you start. By the way, in July, we're going to study the book of James together. Look at highlights of the book of James in July and August. I'm looking forward to that. Number four, a fourth action or attitude that God rewards is when we are loving and encouraging to our spouse and our family. When you are loving and encouraging to your spouse and or your family, when you take care of those in your family. And one of the passages that I wanted to talk about in, in detail, which I can't because y'all made me preach too long on the first three. But here's the thing. Paul says to Timothy, he says, listen, I want you to understand anyone who has children. He's talking about the widows now. He says, look, when it comes to taking care of the widows in the, in the church, because the church took care of them. They, they were the social net for people. He said, when it comes to taking care of folks, if they've got children that are alive or grandchildren, then instruct the children and the grandchildren to take care of their grandparents or their aunts, their uncle, to take care of their family. And it's an interesting word he uses. In fact, in the Greek, he says, I want you to teach them to do this so that they may epit- ep- repay. Come on, help me with that word. Epit- Apoditomize. See, I knew I could say it. I want you to apoditomize them. I want you to take care of them. You're repaying them for the investment they made in you. And as you repay them, I'm going to repay you. But he also goes on to say this, Terry. And I know you don't need to know this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. He says, Terry, if you don't apoditomize them, I will apoditomize you. So if you don't, he says, listen... Taking care of them is your responsibility and duty. It's honoring God. It's returning to them. You you might say, but you don't know the mess I had to put up with. Mm, I understand that. And you don't know the mess God had to put up with to get you. This is not about whether they deserve or whether they earn. This is about you repaying God. They gave you breath. Are you with me? This is about you serving them. This is about you and your spouse. I said this before, and I I didn't make it up, but I quoted somebody else. God didn't make marriage so you could be happy. He made marriage so you could be holy. It teaches you how to suffer. And my wife, if she were here, would say, Amen. It teaches you long-suffering. It teaches you how to be Christ in the midst of crisis. It reflects for you, gives you a clear mirror of your fallen nature. Number five, the fifth action is when we look at making disciples of everyone. Uh, Jesus said this in, in Matthew 28, 19, 20. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all Nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. Now, you know, we, 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 we serve in unreached people groups. We're planting churches in unreached, people, in unreached, unengaged people groups. We're planting churches along the military highway. Over here, we talk about rescuing children from uh, war-torn countries, 10,000 children that have become orphaned because in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and all over the world because or have been sold into slavery in Nepal and the sex trafficking. We've helped to rescue them, and we have a commitment to rescue 10,000 at this year and to uh, help them get planted in Jesus following families. And that's awesome. That's heroic stuff. We, we pay. We help pay the price to do that. And we pray the price for that to get done. But I've never, I've never yet been able to go into a house and kick the door open and rescue a child. Or, or, or go to a country like the country in Africa that we're rescuing or bringing the gospel to a certain people group. I've never yet been able to go there. And I'm probably very in effective if I did go there, but I can pray. But, but there's a, still there's something I can do. In fact, did you know that 75% of all decisions that are made for Christ are made before we turn the age 12? 75%. If I took a, a poll in this room, 75%, I'm 99% sure that all statistics are made up on the spot. So anyway, but 75%, this is true, of all people that come to Christ did so as a child before they turned 12. So you can be a part of making disciples. And here at Mana Church, you can do that in kids' ministry. We've got Mana Kids. They're the big kids back there. And we've not yet opened, because of our time with COVID, we've not yet opened our preschoolers. But I am dying. I'm not dying. I am living to open that classroom. Why? Because I've got a three-year-old grandson. I've got two infant sons that are going to be two by the time they get here. Grandsons, I want them to know Jesus. Now, it's really the mom's and dad's responsibility, but I want to fan into flame that gift of God that is in them. Today, I'm so proud to tell you today, my five-year-old granddaughter, she's going to take communion for the first time in this service. You know why? Because she's received Jesus Christ, and she understands that it's not just crackers and juice. She's come to understand, oh, this is what Jesus did for me. And yes, early she's young, but you know what? There was no age limit on this. If you understand and can communicate what Jesus has done for you, are you with me? You can be a part, and listen, you, you can say, well, I'm not quite there. I'm not quite smart enough yet. I'm not quite spiritual enough yet. And, and, but Jesus said it this way. Look, some of you, you say in, in, in three or four months, then will come the harvest. When things get right, when all the conditions get right, if I were a little younger, if I were a little older, if I were a little holier, if I were a little more grace-filled, then I would do it. But I want you to understand, God changes you in the midst of your service. God ordains that life change would happen in relationship. And as you sow what little you have into the lives of others. Now, don't get me wrong. We're not going to throw you in there with the kids and let them just you know, tie you up in the corner. No, we're, we're going to help. We'll train you. We'll encourage you. We'll give you the resources. But you can be a part of making disciples of this young lady right here, of her, son, of her brother that's sitting in the back. You can be a part of doing that today. And God says, I'll reward that. There's another place where he said, well, you just give a cup of cold water in my name. I'll reward that. So the fourth is when you give. The fifth is when you you make disciples. Whew, I might make it. I might make it. Number six. Number six is when God rewards you when you share your finances and resources with others. Somebody said, oh, I knew I was in church. I was just waiting for him to talk about money. Let me tell you about your money. You are probably one of the most, and I'm going to change that. You are, I, I've pastored four churches. I've served in missions all over the world. But I want to tell you something, man at Church Sanford. You are the most generous and the most faithful people when it comes to advancing God's kingdom and sharing what God has blessed you with of any group that I have ever served. I mean it with all my heart. I cannot tell you the numbers of times that I picked up the phone and someone said, Pastor, I've got such and such. Who needs it? 
Pastor, I heard so-and-so had surgery. I want to I send a meal or I want to send some money to help. Let me tell you something. Not only do you give your tithes that we talk a little about, but you're faithful in doing that. 2020, many people said 2020 with COVID, the church would probably fold. I want to tell you, because of your faithfulness, it was our best financial year. Not because we spent less, but because you outgave. Whenever something came up, you gave and you gave again. Not because you were asked, but because God put it on your heart and God laid it aside for you. I'm telling you. But look, I want you to know something else. Back in February, I didn't mention this to you, but back in February... I got a phone call. Remember in Texas, they had the freeze. Remember that freeze in Texas? It was the worst thing that happened ever. Whoever thought it was like hell would freeze over before Texas freezes over, right? And Texas froze over, and they, they were in a mess because they did not have, they didn't have the supplies they needed to even address some of those issues. Well, you know, we planted a couple of churches down in Texas, and so down in San Antonio and uh, in Fort Hood. And so here's what we did. Like, give me that picture up here. So all of the man of churches got together. How we were doing it? All the man of churches got together. Now, this is one of the trucks. But we loaded two of these 26-foot U-Haul trucks. We didn't. I didn't go load them, but we helped pay for you. I'm going to rephrase that. You help pay for when you give to benevolence and you give to missions. You help pay for two 26-foot trucks that was packed not only with water and things of that nature, but plumbing supplies because pipes had burst and they run out of, they didn't have the supplies to fix. We sent plumbing supplies. We sent all kinds of things. You help do that. So when you give, when you share, share with what God's brought into your life when you do these things Jesus says he sees them and he blesses them he moved by the power of his spirit and you had the opportunity to serve down in Katy Texas San Antonio Texas you helped folks that you didn't even know you gave so that could happen this week you put there was a family who had two children who they, they weren't their children. They were taking care of the children while mom goes to rehab. And you put clothes on the back of those children because they didn't have anything. This week you ministered to orphans in Haiti because you gave. Because you gave, you empowered Pastor John, who was with us here Friday, uh, Wednesday night, talking about prayer and spiritual warfare. You lifted his ministry as you sowed. Some of you might say, well, I didn't even know he was here. I understand that. But because you've given, you had a hand in giving. Jesus said it this way. He said, listen, when it comes to your charitable giving, he says, do it in secret. Don't even let your left hand know what your right hand's doing, which is really kind of weird, right? Have you ever tried to do that? It's like my brain's going to tell my right hand it can't keep a secret here, but you know what he's pointing at. He's pointing to the motivations. He says, when you do these things, and when you do these things as a body of believers, when you give to the Reach Out Celebration, the rock, once a year, we take that big offering and all through the year. We, but when you do that, listen, you need to understand God sees when you write that check. God sees that. And I'm not asking you for money here. I'm telling you, you're sowing into the lives of people you may never meet this side of eternity, but God sees it. And God blesses it. Let me give you one last one, number seven. Number seven is when we understand the sovereignty of God and we obey Jesus. He said it this way, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross for whoever desires to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it for what profit is it if a man gains the whole world but loses his own soul for years I've heard messages and quote unquote prophets 
Say if you give a thousand, God will outgive you and all about what we can get back. And I really, 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 really don't want you to misunderstand this message as that at all. This is not about give a dollar, get a dollar. This is about giving your life. The seventh way that we serve God and that He blesses in eternity is when we take up our cross and we say, Thy will be done, not my will be done. Jesus, in fact, says, as He concludes in verse 24, He says, The day will come when I return. He said, the Son of Man will return with His holy angels and He will come and with Him He will bring His reward. A reward which He will give. Now for some, that reward will be eternal punishment and that's sad to me. And what's really important about this whole message is that if you live your life with eternity in view, if you live your life recognizing when you serve that hamburger, you're not just serving a hamburger, when you, when you put gas in that car, when you pay for someone's meal, when you extend love, when you extend grace, when you do something in the name of love for someone else, it is not just temporal it is eternal and God sees that and he will reward that wouldn't it be amazing if when we get home Dave we discover that reward is not a big golden mansion with pearly gates or whatever for us personally but it's the untold multitudes we had no idea that was watching my sermon the sermon that I live 24 7 who decided at some point that Christians may not be flaky that maybe they're not hypocritical that maybe this grace of God is real that if God could change you he might be able to change me if he could forgive you he might be able to forgive me and wouldn't it be amazing if the reward that we receive when we get there is the untold thousands of thousands upon thousands who he has reached into their lives and wiped away every tear removed every pain broken every shackle and what we hear is the story of his glory how God did for them what only he could do but he chose to use you and he chose to use me as a vessel to invite them in oh stop thinking about my mansion on a hill and realize Jesus climbed that hill for you but in climbing it for you he climbed it for others and the change he's made in you is the down payment of the change he wants to make in your neighbor in your boss when your boss says to you she comes up and says you know I don't understand it but your attitude is different than anybody else's I don't understand it but you know I, I just see there's something different about you you know the Bible says that whenever someone asks you what made the difference why are you different than everyone else be ready to give an account why am I different it's not because I'm a good man it's not because I'm a smart man it's because I'm a born-again man I was dead I was dead but now I'm alive not because I'm good but because he is gracious would you bow your heads father I love you so much if you're with us online I, I want to invite you to bow your heads as well I hope you were able to get the notes if not we'll, we'll make those available for you to download listen whether you're online right now or you're in this room whether you're in this room or you're in your living room or your bedroom or you're in your car watching this or listening to this I want you to hear loud and clear this whole system of rewards that we're talking about, this life that God rewards we're talking about, it's not about money, it's not about stock market. Jesus said it this way, what if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? What profit is that for you? What I want you to understand today is what Christ has paid for you, what Christ has done for you, He'll do for others. And He wants to use you as an example to others so that we might see heaven full and hell empty so with every head bowed every eye closed I want to just ask you first to make the simple prayer if you see what I'm talking about 
and God has inspired you or convicted you, then I want to invite you to pray this simple prayer and make a commitment to God today that you're going to live a life that repays Him <laughs> for what He's already done for you. Everything we do, God, we can't earn your love. We can't earn salvation or forgiveness. It's a free gift. But every breath I take is an opportunity to thank you that I'm not the man I used to be. To thank you that what was broken has been repaired and restored because of your grace, because of your love. So, Father, today we commit ourselves fresh to you, to follow you with our whole heart and to serve you with all our strength in Jesus name now if you're here today and you've never you've never asked Christ to be the Lord of your life or you're online watching this is a great opportunity and I, listen I, I think it's a really simple process it's it, it costs Christ everything to redeem you but he simply said if you believe in your heart if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord that you will be saved and it will impact not only you but your entire household so so it's a simple prayer it's a first step in your process but if you've never taken it you've got to start there and so i'll pray a simple prayer and invite you to pray it with me if you'd like to make jesus the lord of your life if you want to make heaven your home you want to be free of of all that the enemy has put on your life all the brokenness all the shame all the the, the weirdness right now just pray this simple prayer father in jesus name i ask you to forgive me i've lived life my way and so i ask you to forgive me of the mess i've made jesus i ask you to come into my heart i believe that you lived that you died for me that you rose from the grave and i confess today that i want you to be the lord of my life i will serve you forever in Jesus name amen listen if you prayed that I believe you've taken the first step and I want to help you take the next steps as well and I want you to talk with me about that and let's make a plan to help you grow would you stand with me I got a blessing get you out of here so the next group can get in but thank you for being with me this morning thank you for letting me just go at it with you and and I pray that this has been a message that has encouraged and inspired you so lift your hands and let me bless you Father, thank you for everyone that is here. Thank you for everyone that is watching. Lord, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to make much of Jesus one more time. And so now I speak the blessing of the Lord over you. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and may the Lord give unto you his peace. Remember that you've been redeemed. And you were no longer the tail, but now you're the head. You have been lifted out of the darkness and have been clothed with a garment of light so that wherever you go, you go as an ambassador of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God bless you in Jesus' name. And everyone said together, amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Love you. See you next week.